Nature's poisons here collected, water, earth, and air infected. Oh, what a pity such a city was in such a place erected. In the year 1793, yellow fever killed more than one-fifth of the city's population. Lack of pure water in the city's wells was thought to be the cause of the epidemic. A reliable source of water was desperately needed to clean the streets and to fight the hundreds of accidental fires. At the turn of the 19th century, Philadelphia was the most populated city in America. Located between the Schuylkill and Delaware rivers, there was plenty of water nearby, but no method to distribute it to homes and businesses. Without a successful water distribution system, Philadelphia would not thrive. City leaders joined together and came up with a brilliant solution. Philadelphia became the first major city in the world to consider water delivery as a municipal responsibility. The city built a pumping station to draw fresh water from the Schuylkill River and to deliver it to a second pumping and storage station at Center Square, the future site of City Hall. Although the use of steam engines to pump water from the Schuylkill River was revolutionary, the water storage tanks could not hold enough water to keep up with the demand. The watering committee, charged with providing the city's water, needed new ideas and technologies to deliver water for the city's ever-growing population. They assigned the project to a very talented young engineer, Frederick Graff. Under Graff's recommendation, a huge outdoor reservoir was built on top of Fair Mount, a flat high hill at the edge of the Schuylkill River. Two massive steam engines would lift water to the reservoir, and then, just by gravity, fresh water would effortlessly flow down to serve Philadelphia homes and businesses. The engine house at Fairmount Waterworks was designed by Graff and combined innovative engineering with architectural beauty. The exterior of the engine house looked like a large country mansion, but inside were amazing technologies. From a pipe located in the middle of the school kill, water flowed into the building. Boilers 24 feet long generated the steam pressure that powered the massive steam engine's big flywheels that, in turn, operated piston pumps. Water was pushed by the pumps through a cast iron pipe and rose more than 90 feet up to the reservoir. Two million gallons of fresh water poured into the reservoir every 24 hours. Five wooden water mains connected the reservoir to the original Center Square distribution system. From Center Square, water was delivered to 3,500 subscribers through wooden pipes made from hollowed out logs. By 1817, there were more than 32 miles of spruce and yellow pine pipes connected to private homes and 300 hydrants placed in the streets for public use. Over the years, Frederick Graff developed air chambers, stopcocks, curved pipe joints, adjustable valves, faucets, water troughs, public fountains, and hydrants. The steam boilers were once located next to the very room in which you are now sitting. With the constant fire, steam, and high pressure, these early boilers were dangerous. Then, disaster struck. In 1818, and then again in 1821, the boilers exploded. The city urgently needed safer and cheaper technology to power the pumps. Once again, the watering committee turned to Frederick Graff. They had tried the Industrial Revolution's cutting-edge technology steam power, and now 
with truly visionary thinking, they solved the problem by returning to the most ancient and efficient source of power, the water power of the Schuylkill itself. With the construction in 1821 of Fairmount Dam, the golden age of the Fairmount Waterworks began. The dam redirected the river. At 1,712 feet in length, it was the longest dam in the world. It lifted the river, creating a lake six miles long behind it. The water was redirected into a forebay behind the mill house. This forebay had been blasted out of solid bedrock to channel the river through the buildings. Once inside this new industrial complex, some of the water was channeled to the pumps, while most of the river water filled the buckets of the water wheels that turned to power the pumps. The weight of the water in the buckets provided enough power to turn eight massive water wheels. Each wheel was 15 feet wide and 16 feet in diameter and turned almost silently at a rapid 14 revolutions per minute. When exiting from the wheels, the water returned to the natural channel of the river below the dam. Each turning water wheel powered a pump that pushed the diverted river water from its flume through a pipe up to the reservoir. It took about 30 gallons of water to lift one gallon of water up to the reservoir. And from the reservoir, at first wooden, then cast iron pipes distributed water throughout Philadelphia. The water power solution was another stroke of genius. It was simple, elegant, efficient, and economical. The cost of running the waterworks went from $206 for pumping a million gallons of water to less than $4. In an amazing turnaround, the Fairmount Waterworks became the most profitable business enterprise in the city. With its impressive engineering marvels and pastoral beauty, the waterworks became one of the most visited and depicted attractions in America. The waterworks buildings were embellished with public promenades, sculptures, and gardens. William Rush, the renowned Philadelphia artist, created two allegorical sculptures, which continue today to adorn the entrances of the waterworks. From different vantage points around the buildings, visitors could witness the awesome spectacle of the waterworks. The Schuylkill River flowed through the buildings powering the pumps that constantly replenished the 22 million gallon reservoir. Visitors strolled through the immaculately groomed grounds and marveled at fountains of water shooting up to 40 feet in the air. Seeing the waterworks in operation was a breathtaking scene described by visitors from all over the world. One of the pleasantest visits a man can pay in Philadelphia on a hot day is through the waterworks at Fairmount on the Schuylkill. No city can be better supplied with water than this. I never looked upon that pure liquid welling through the pipes and deluging the thirsty streets without feeling gratitude and respect to these waterworks and the pride with which Philadelphians regard their spirited public labor. The growing population demanded more water, but there was a problem. The tidal portion of the river is located below the dam. Twice a day at high tide, the river rose enough to backflow into the wells of the water wheels, causing the wheels to slow or stop for several hours each day. In another major engineering and construction project, the vertical water wheels were replaced with innovative horizontal turbine wheels that were not affected by the river's tidal changes. The force of the river flowed into the turbines, down through the blades, which rotated, and then transferred this power to a series of gears that drove the pumps. During the Civil War era, a new mill house was constructed for the new Jean Val turbines. In time, all the water wheels were replaced with turbines. While adding a new building and new technology, the basic flow pattern of the water power remained the same. 
With the new building, the dam redirected the river through control gates and tunnels into flumes and down through the horizontal Jean Val turbines. Each turbine powered a series of gears that drove a flywheel and crankwheel connected to a crankshaft, converting the circular motion to a back and forth horizontal motion. The connecting rod pushed water via a piston and a series of check valves into a force main with an air chamber that smoothed the thrust of the water as it was pushed up to the reservoir. The pump was engineered to work very efficiently in both directions of the piston. It pumped water as the piston thrust forward and then pumped water as it was pulled back again. Philadelphia continued to grow. The city limits that had once measured two square miles had now grown to 130 square miles. By this time, the American Industrial Revolution was in full swing, bringing both rapid growth and an environmental catastrophe. The Watering Committee had anticipated the devastating effects of pollution. The city had purchased as much land as possible upriver to prevent industrial development along the Schuylkill Riverbanks. This acquired land became Fairmount Park, one of the largest municipal park systems in the world. Yet farther upstream, the mills, factories and mines emptied waste and sewage into the river. This pollution ultimately made the river run black, killing off fish and wildlife until the once pristine Schuylkill had become a smelly, polluted, open sewer. These horrific conditions spread disease and created a public health crisis with thousands dying from typhoid and cholera epidemics. And so, the golden age of the Fairmount Waterworks ended. The Fairmount Waterworks were finally decommissioned in 1909 after nine glorious decades of valuable service. By the early 1920s, the Philadelphia Museum of Art was built where the reservoirs had been. For the next 50 years, the engine house and the mill house buildings were converted for use as a public aquarium and swimming pool. In 1976, as part of the bicentennial, the Fairmount Waterworks was declared a national historic landmark. The civic interest and technology required to provide abundant and economical fresh water was first manifested in these buildings you are now visiting. Philadelphia's vision became the model for cities throughout the world. Today, the Fairmount Waterworks stands restored. Its water wheels are silent, yet its very presence speaks to us of a 200-year commitment to health, innovative technology, the natural environment, and artistic expression for the public good.